Good evening, everyone. I'm Clyde Derrick, Assistant Dean for Development in the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at UC Riverside. Welcome. I'm very honored to welcome you to our second UCR Brain Game Center lecture by the Center's Director, Professor Aaron Seitz. Professor Seitz earned his BA in Theoretical Mathematics from Reed College, his PhD in Computational Neuroscience from Boston University, and conducted his postdoctoral work in systems neuroscience at Harvard Medical School. He was also a research assistant professor at Boston University before coming to UC Riverside in 2008. While his primary appointment is in psychology, he holds cooperative appointments in bioengineering, biomedical sciences, computer science, the interdisciplinary neuroscience program, and psychiatry. He is the director of the UCR Aging Initiative and director of the UCR Brain Game Center. And he'll be sharing more with you about his work in the Brain Game Center tonight and in more programs to come. These lectures are co-sponsored by the UCR Palm Desert Center and the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at UC Riverside. This evening, we would like to thank the UCR Palm Desert Center partners for their support of our community programming. Also, we would like to especially acknowledge Bob and Cheryl Fay for their continuing generosity in supporting programming at UCR Palm Desert Center, as well as their work with UCR Brain Game Center. <clears throat> Additionally, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Kahuilla, Tongva, Luiseño, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Before I introduce Professor Seitz, I'd like to share with you the format of tonight's one hour program. Professor Seitz will offer his lecture, and during that time, you're invited to enter any questions you have in the Q&A. Following the lecture, we'll have a brief Q&A. Those questions we can answer in the course of the program, Professor Seitz will be happy to respond to by email. And now, Professor Aaron Seitz. Great, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Let me start screen sharing, just one second. Okay, hopefully you can now all see my screen. And so today I'm gonna to talk about how we can better measure and train our hearing. And as a reminder, um, this is part of a talk series where last time I talked about vision and I'll just give a quick reminder of some of those topics. Today I'm talking about hearing and then April 28th, I'm gonna talk about memory. And that a lot of this research is in this field of brain training, um, which has been getting a lot of excitement in terms of how we're able to leverage our understanding of psychology and neuroscience in order to be able to kind of make our brains fit. Um, and the analogy is similar to um, with physical fitness over the last hundred years, as we learn more about the cardiovascular system and muscle physiology, we're able to come up with training programs that could make people run faster for longer, jump higher, et cetera, and so on. And right now there's excitement that similar things can be done for the brain. The challenge though in this field is I think best shown is this example of what I call specificity for memory training. And so an example that I've kind of brought up before is that a very popular way to train memory is this task called the NBAP test. And the way this task works is that you see a series of screens where you're supposed to kind of look in the center like at these pluses and that um, there'll be these blue squares that will appear. So the first, the bottom right-hand corner, the next, the bottom left-hand corner. And then 
In this case, where we see the bottom right-hand corner again, this is the target to the two back task because what I saw two items ago. The next one, top middle, is not a match because two items ago I saw the bottom left. And you keep on going forward. So eventually the last one is a match for what I saw two items ago. And you could do this task where with each presentation you just report whether this is what you saw two items ago and you could train. And if you do well with the two back, you then move to the three back. Does this match what I saw three items ago? And there's lots of training studies, some in younger adults like I'm showing you here, some in older adults, some in children, that show that you could train people across multiple days to get better at this task. And then the big question is, so you know that there has been learning. When you go to the grocery store and try to remember what you're supposed to get, does this transfer to those real world contexts? And some studies have found evidence that it can. Other studies find that it might not. And so one of the things that we founded the UCR Brain Game Center for is to try to do principled research and create new programs that we can then disseminate that will both help us understand and kind of train brain fitness in a way that does transfer to the real world. And so today I'm talking about hearing, but we look at a lot of different aspects of cognition. And in all cases, we're trying to gather the evidence to understand what are the cases where the learning will have these real world consequences? When is it only just teaching to the test? And how we could then use this knowledge to be able to come up with you know, more useful procedures. One example that I gave last time was on vision. And so I talked about perceptual learning where essentially what this field looks at is in the case of vision, how we can improve the way that the brain reads out the information that comes in from the eye. And I gave an example of one of the first training programs we came up with, where we were able to show that we could train on a vision training app and that we could see outcomes that transferred to people playing baseball. And that this is really the model that we're looking for in all of our studies is kind of what is the time where we can train, you know, maybe a task on the iPad that then will transfer to the activities of daily living. And looking for today's lecture, hearing is something that is a major concern to lots of different people. And so you see here three women who are talking at an outdoor restaurant. And there's a challenge here in terms of your ability to understand the person that you're listening to in the face of all the other noises that might exist. And so this might be other sounds from your table, other people talking at other tables, the music that might be blasting, wind that might be going, and that this is a major challenge, especially as we get older. And one big importance of hearing loss, and this is um, just a picture from a recent study in the Lancet Journal of Dementia Prevention, is that what they found looking at kind of what are the factors in early life, midlife, late life that predict dementia. And what we could see in this figure is that this big circle where there's a 9% with hearing loss, this is the biggest predictor of any of the other factors of late life onset of dementia. And so you're hearing at midlife and how it continues to evolve you know, in late life seems to be a major factor that determines our cognitive fitness as a whole. And there's lots of reasons for this. Some of it has to do with hearing itself. Others are that there's some social isolation that comes when you have trouble hearing people. And that, so the lack of social contact it can also lead to cognitive decline. But whatever the vectors, one thing which is really important is really how can we better determine when there is somebody that is starting to experience hearing loss that could be significant later in life? And then what are the types of things we could do to intervene to be able to help these individuals? And this gets us to kind of what is the state of the art? And the state of the art would be audiology. 
And so what I'm showing you here is a picture of kind of a typical audiological test environment. So you see this woman with headphones who's in the room behind the glass. And it's a standard task where there are tones that are being played and she's supposed to raise her hand whenever she hears a sound. And the audiologist has an instrument where they're able to make the sounds go quieter and quieter in order to be able to estimate what these hearing thresholds are. And the first thing I want to note is that this is a very expensive setup. So you have a trained audiologist, you have a soundproof room, it's typically a medical facility. Um, and so it takes a lot to do these hearing exams. And lots of people who have hearing issues are not well served um, by standard audiological clinics. They might not just be within driving range um, you know, of their daily activities, for example. And then the measure that you get, the most common test in audiology is what's called this pure tone audiogram. And so we could see on the left is the general scale of this, is that um, as you go down, these are louder sounds. So how loud the sound has to be for you to be able to hear it. And as you go from left to right, you're going from low pitch to high pitch. And on the right, you could see is an example of an audiogram for somebody who has high frequency hearing loss. And so what you see is that um, for the low frequencies, the hearing is mostly within a normal range. But when you get to the high frequencies, we see that they need to be made much louder than is typical for them to be able to hear it. And so these tests are very useful. They serve lots of people. If you have uh, hearing loss on this test, oftentimes you're gonna be served by getting a hearing aid. But there's also something that people talk about, which it comes with lots of different names, but one is hidden hearing loss. And so hidden hearing loss refers to the people who perform somewhat normally on the audiogram, but still have hearing problems. And so this is a, um, poster that I found that you know, shows some of the indications. So you have trouble hearing people incorrectly or you hear people incorrectly. You prefer quieter settings for conversations. You're easily distracted and unable to focus in noisy settings. Um, and you feel that you have hearing loss even though you pass a hearing test. And so a lot of the research that we're doing is trying to understand what might be going on in hitting hearing loss and how we might be to better serve people who have these issues. And as a neuroscientist, you know, I want to talk a little bit. And so just one slide that talks about, you know, how the brain helps us hear. And so this is the picture of the brain. And so this would be somebody facing forward. And so on the side of your head, is where we have this little stripe, which we call primary auditory cortex. And so this is the first region where the neocortex, so the main part of the brain that we think about, starts to hear. And what's remarkable about this is that if you look at it, there's actually a map where you could see that um, towards the front, you have low frequencies, so like 500 hertz that's represented, and towards the back, you have higher frequencies represented. So that similar to this pure tone audiogram, there is a representation of these tones in this first part of the brain. However, when you think about speech that we typically are trying to understand, it's much more complex. And so what this graph is showing here on the right is what we call spectrograms. And so on the x-axis, which is not shown, we have time. And on the y-axis, we have frequencies. So we're basically at the bottom is low frequencies, at the top is high frequencies. And so what I want you to see in this graph is that speech involves frequencies that are changing over time. So we see that here, you know, it starts off with a low frequency and this range, it goes up. This one's going up. Here's another frequency band where it's going down with time but you basically have these complex, what we call spectral temporal modulations. 
where it's a fancy words thing, the frequency changes with time. And what's interesting is that I'm showing you these spectrograms for the word lock, which I have on the left, and rock on the right, and they're super similar to each other. It's really only within this mid range where you see that um, this set of frequencies kind of is going down a little bit in lock and up a little bit in rock. And a lot of what people have been studying is when we look at this primary auditory cortex, it doesn't just like pure tones. It really likes these frequencies that changes across time. And so just giving an image of like what this looks like. So this is just another picture showing in this case what we had with the rock where it's kind of going up and hopefully you'll be able to hear the sound. So you can hear basically, you know, it sounds like the frequency is going up. And for lock, which is going down. And so it doesn't sound like speech in this context, because to actually understand it as speech, you need to have all these other frequency bands. But what's important about this, and this is really for someone like me who tries to take understanding of neuroscience and it turn it into tests of hearing or training of hearing is that if you record from these individual neurons and primary auditory cortex, they love these sounds that are just kind of going up a little bit or down a little bit in time, much more than tones. And some of them prefer it when the sound goes up and others prefer it when the sound goes down. And this gives us hints in terms of how the brain is breaking up sounds into units that it then has to understand and then build up into things like speech and music and other perceptions that rely upon this processing. So one dimension that's gonna be important with what I talk about is just the spectral temporal modulations as being something that's important, more than just pure tones. The other is something that I alluded to earlier, and I think a lot of you are familiar with, it's sometimes called the cocktail party problem. And so this is a circumstance where you're in a room um, or it could happen outside. You have lots of people talking and you're trying to focus on one person and understand what they're saying. And the way that we talk about this in terms of hearing sciences and kind of neuroscience is what we call auditory scene analysis. And essentially what this is, is that, so I'm showing you uh, another way of looking at sound. So this is now showing basically how the amplitude of the sound changes across time. And so this first one is a frog, you know, ribbit. Um, the next one's a splash. And then a bird could be singing. And so, we're able to hear these as separate sounds. Typically though, what we're trying to extract this out of is that we have the frog, the bird, and the splash all at the same time. And so a big thing that we need to solve, I mean, this is one of the biggest problems for our brain when we hear, is to be able to segregate, I heard a frog, I heard a bird, um, and I heard a splash all being separate sounds. And that a lot of the cues to this um, are from what we call binaural here, just how the sound is different between your two ears. And so on the left, we see a person who has good binaural hearing, so both ears are working well. And so you could see that this helps them segregate the sounds coming from different locations. So the dog, the car, the bird, the plane, the people, they're all in different locations. And by basically having two sensors, we're able to segregate the sounds coming to different spots, as opposed to if you only have um, one ear that is functioning well, then what happens is it sounds like all the sounds are coming from the same location, which is kind of shown on the right. And this isn't just an issue in terms of if you have hearing loss in one ear. Sometimes if you have hearing aids, you could have the same type of problem where you have trouble localizing sounds because hearing aids in some cases will remove some of the cues 
that you use to kind of solve this localization problem. And so when we think about like, what gives rise to hitting hearing loss? It's important to note that when we look at these pure tones that this audiogram helps us understand, this is looking at essentially the function of the inner ear. The inner ear is really good at discriminating different frequencies. But when we start looking at other brain processes, we see that um, it's after the inner ear where it starts becoming sensitive to the spectral temporal modulations and the cues that give rise to sound localization. And it's those that are important to be able to understand speech or music or all the complex sounds that are beyond just the pure tones. And so what we think in terms of how we could better understand things like hidden hearing loss is to be able to come up with better ways of characterizing what's happening in the brain that may be giving rise to difficulties in localizing sounds or being able to give rise to how the sounds are changing in time and things of that sort. And so one of the first things that we did in the Brain Game Center to try to help understand hearing is we developed this application that we call PART. And it stands for Portable Adaptive Rapid Testing. And what's exciting about PART is a few things. One is that we were able to build in a lot of different tests that allow us to be able to better understand binaural hearing and how the ear is able to work together. Um, things like the spectral temporal processing, task to speech and noise, but we could basically create lots of different hearing tests to understand the myriad of processes that are required to operate well in order for us to successfully hear what we wanna hear. But the other thing is that it could run on an iPad or a phone. Um, and so what we've been doing is looking to see how we could test people's hearing outside of the audiology clinic and get data that is um, informative to what the hearing difficulties might be. And so one example of this is that we have tests that we call like speech and competition. And so essentially this is a test of the cocktail party effect. So you have a listener that's shown by that blue dot and that there's a target speaker in front of them. And they're saying something like, ready Charlie, go, go to blue three now. And then the person is supposed to click on the blue three and they might be ready Charlie, go to um, red five now. And they click on the red five. And we could first kind of measure the hearing when there's just one person. And then we could simulate, um, and this requires headphones, but we could simulate what it sounds like if you have three people speaking at once. So one person might be saying, ready, Charlie. Um, another person might be saying, ready, Eagle. And then they each say different color names and numbers. And so this is now the problem that you have to solve at that restaurant or the cocktail party or lots of situations is how can you successfully listen to your target speaker and ignore the maskers? And one of the things we could do with this program is that we could first measure hearing when it's in the normal situation where the people are separated from each other. And then we could simulate a case where the target and the maskers are all at the same location. So right on top of each other. And we could measure what is the difference of how loud the target needs to be compared to those maskers. So you could still understand them. And so just you know, a little bit of data, what we see is that um, here in this case where they're separated, that you can understand a much quieter sound than when they're on top of each other. And so we calculate this value called spatial release, which is 
essentially how successful is your binaural hearing in being able to help you solve the cocktail party problem. But the other thing which is exciting here is that these orange bars are showing the values we tested when we ran on the iPad with just regular headphones. And the blue bars are showing the values we measured in the same people when we measure them in a sound booth with special audiological equipment. And we could see either on the left where the blue bars and the orange bars are practically identical or on the right where we look at individual by individual was their measurement threshold the same um, in the iPad on the x-axis or the sound booth on the y-axis is the values are pretty much the same. So both we are able to show that we have these hearing tests that are able to measure how successfully people are to, as I said, kind of solve the cocktail party problem. But also we could do this just on standard consumer electronics and that we don't need to be in a sound booth. We could do this in just any relatively quiet environment. In fact, we've done studies where we've tested people where we um, had cafeteria noise playing where we made recordings of the cafeteria and then play them over speakers when they did their hearing tests and found that the performance is pretty similar compared to if you test in an acquired environment. And so this is just kind of one of a bunch of different studies we're doing. But the exciting thing is that we can now do hearing tests outside the clinic. And the hearing tests we could do are ones that could test things that they don't test in the clinic. And we hope that we'll be able to test a lot more people and then start understanding what are the different dimensions of hitting hearing loss. And by understanding the different dimensions, then what are the different needs that people might have to be able to successfully intervene and improve their hearing? And that gets to kind of one of the other areas that we're working on is how can we train hearing? And so the key is that, and this is similar for those of you who saw the vision talk, is that what we try to do is understand the different dimensions of hearing that might be um, impaired in a different individual. So in this case, there's two major ones that I spoke about. One is your ability to hear where the sound is coming from. And then the other is your ability to distinguish what I was calling these spectral temporal modulations, how the sounds change over time. And so we did is we created a game. And so I'll just show you a little bit about this is that um, actually before I start it, your character is a Swiss. And what I hope you'll be able to hear, they'll be a little bit quiet, um, is that the sound will sometimes go up. And when it goes up, they have to move the whisk up. And when it goes down, they have to move it down. And there's barriers that they avoid to do this. And so I'll just play this for a little bit. So that went up. And so you have to move the wisp up. Again, up. And that one swept down and down again. And so within this game framework, what we're able to do is that we train these multiple dimensions of hearing. So some levels are where the sound goes up or goes down. And you just have to move the wisp up or down based upon what you hear. And what we could do is we can measure how well you could hear. And that when you're doing well, we make it harder. And so we could basically change the program adaptively so that it finds your individualized hearing threshold. So when you could just barely distinguish up from down. And we could give you lots of practice around those levels. And for the localization task, we do something very similar. Is that in this case, the sound will either be coming from the left or the right. And that we can measure um, how small of a distance left or right you could discriminate. And then what we do in both programs is that sometimes we do it in quiet and sometimes we add different types of noises to make it harder. And then the last task that we've been using in the game 
is an auditory memory task. And so this is one that's very similar is that you hear these sounds that um, sometimes are going up and down. Sometimes, you know, they kind of are like speech sounds and we can measure your ability to match whether a later sound is the same as an earlier sound. And so, and we do this as we make the sounds hidden in noise. And so this way, it's similar to like listening to my speech right now is the only way you could understand anything I'm saying is that you have to remember the sequence of my sounds over time. And so there's other modules that we plan to add to this, but the key idea here is that we understand what are some of the different dimensions that the brain needs to get right in order to successfully hear. And then we come up with training modules that are able to train people on these different dimensions. And then we look to see if we train with this game, does it transfer to your ability to hear speech when there's other people speaking? And so this is just some early data that we have from college students. We're planning on doing some studies in older adults and other individuals who have hearing impairments. Um, but what we see is that compared to their pre-training thresholds, that when we look at mid-training and then after training, that um, there's a pretty big improvement um, in people's ability to do speech and competition. And these are similar to what I showed you with the slide before. If you have somebody saying, ready, Charlie, go to blue three now, um, in the face of other speakers who will be saying things at the same time. And so we could use that part app, as I said, to measure people's hearing. And then this listen app to train people's hearing. And then if we test people who were trained on just a control game, what we find is that they did not show much improvement um, in the speech and competition. And so just you know, some discussion of the auditory training is that you know, we have some early evidence that, you know, this type of program, at least for certain individuals, can improve their ability to understand speech and competition. Um, one caveat is that everybody that we've trained right now are college students. And so they already have excellent hearing. And so there wasn't a lot of room for improvement. And so one of the things we're very curious about is you know, we might see larger effects um, in people of hearing difficulties. Or as a researcher, I always have to acknowledge that we might run into problems where this game doesn't serve them. Um, and so what we're really interested in is, you know, how can we build upon this finding in order to determine, you know, who are the people who we might be able to test their um, hearing, find that they have hitting hearing loss that might be partially explained by the ability to localize sounds or to be able to discriminate these spectral temporal modulations. And then we could train them with this game, get them better at those kind of basic features of hearing. And that there's some hope that this will transfer to their ability to hear the person they want to listen to in a noisy restaurant. And so we have a whole bunch of hearing studies that we'll be carrying out over the next few years. And so some of them are focused on creating more efficient diagnostics for central auditory dysfunction, which is kind of another word for hidden hearing loss. Um, and so we're really looking at, you know, what are the different dimensions of hearing that we could come up with sensitive tests for? We're also looking at how creating games and using virtual reality might be able to improve hearing tests because one of the things that has been observed um, in the clinic is that even when you test people with their ability to um, hear speech amongst you know, different types of noise, um, that people will sometimes do well on those tests, but still report that they have trouble hearing in restaurants and other ecological conditions. And so the question is why? Is it because there are other cues that are not being well under measured? 
that by using something like VR, we could better, better simulate. And so maybe adding realism is going to be beneficial. Or the other is that when you do a hearing test, it's all you're doing, is that you're giving all of your attention to solving this one hearing test. Can I hear what this number the person is saying? When you're listening to somebody speak in a normal circumstance, you're typically doing other things. Um, you know, we're almost always multitasking in some way. And so this is the way the game can basically simulate um, essentially adding some cognitive load, some additional cognitive challenges of, you know, you're trying to listen to somebody at the restaurant at the same time, you're trying to figure out what you want to order. Um, that's a distraction. It makes it harder. And so maybe adding in some of these elements are necessary to really understand people's hearing issues. We're also looking, as I said before, is to take um, our hearing training programs and look to see whether we could help people who actually have hearing difficulties. Um, and then the other thing is that we're looking at testing relationships between hearing cognition. And so these are studies that you could participate in. Um, and actually, I'm hoping that some of you might sign up, that we have a couple studies that we plan to launch over the next um, month or so. So one is this hearing and cognition study where we'll pay you 150 bucks, we'll loan you a tablet computer, um, and what we'll require is for you to um, get on Zoom with us and do some cognitive tests that will be on the iPad, um, you know, first, you know, some in April and then for this particular study in May. For those who, um, you know, want to just do things on their own device, there's another online hearing study that we're about to launch next month where this one would pay $20 where you just download our software on your own um, smartphone or tablet. Um, you need headphones and do some hearing tests. And later on, we're gonna start doing more of these training studies. Um, and so if you're interested in any of this or the vision training or the memory training, just go to bgc.ucr.edu forward slash sign up. And there's a form you could fill out that you could basically enter your interests and we'll contact you when the studies are ready. Um, I definitely wanna thank that there is a large number of people that we're working with in order to develop um, both these training programs and these testing programs. Um, and I wanna give some time for questions. So um, I'll kind of leave the screen up um, for a little bit in terms of how you could participate in studies um, or you know, we're always, um, looking for donations to be able to fund new projects as well. Um, and thank you, I'll answer some questions. I'm muted, I'm muted. and now I'm not. Aaron, thank you, that was tremendous. Um, we have a bevy of incredible questions. We may not get to them all. In case we don't, again, what we'll do is gather them in an email and send uh, the responses to all registrants. So we will start with this question. I was told after taking several hearing tests that I have reverse slope hearing or hearing loss. Lately, I seem to have trouble not with being able to hear, actually loud noise is extremely irritating, but with understanding, like it takes several milliseconds after something is spoken for me to completely understand. Would hearing aids help? So, that's partially a question out of my expertise and that um, the, I, I'm not an audiologist. And so, you know, I'm not certified to kind of say whether hearing aids are the best solution. At the same time, hearing aids generally are good for making quiet sounds louder. And so if it's an issue in terms of understanding what you hear, that's often the time where looking for other solutions is better. Um, and so I think in your particular case, I would need to kind of understand the circumstance better to know whether you know, a training program like LISTEN would be beneficial or not. Um, but it's exactly why we're doing this research. 
because what we really want to be able to do is provide better answers. And so our whole goal is to get people to do a range of different hearing tests. And then ideally to then start looking at the different types of interventions that map onto these different phenotypes of hearing that we could identify with these tests. And, you know, get to the point where there are answers that are available that are better than what I could give you today. Great. Next question. Any thoughts on tinnitus, causes and natural recommendations? All my hearing tests came back normal, but the buzzing won't go away. 5G? <laughs> so that's a great question. And, you know, once again, it's another one where <sighs> tinnitus is diverse so that for some people, it's there's pretty good evidence that there's issues in your inner ear that are giving rise to it. For other people, there's evidence that it might be a central auditory processing issue and that it might be not your ear, but more of your brain that is giving rise to the problem. And that there's lots of different interventions, um, but we don't know enough about how to understand for given individuals, what is the source of the tinnitus and what is the intervention that's gonna serve them best? And so once again, I kind of feel like I, I wanna be to get more because the answer is almost the same as the previous question is that this is why we're doing this research because we hope to be able to come up with tests that'll help us differentiate between the tinnitus that's more peripheral versus central um, and what types of interventions will be good for which underlying problems. Um, but it's right now one of the major questions, but not as satisfactory with the answers. Terrific. Probably not 5G though. What biomedical biomarkers are related to hearing? Once again, not really the cent center of my expertise. Um, and, and it also depends on kind of how you think about biomedical biomarkers in that there's the history where, you know, people will primarily look at hearing where they'll do an inspection of your ear. They might look at, um, e.g. Um, signatures to basically look at brainstem responses and try to find where in the auditory pathway there seems to be a physiological signature that um, is out of the normal range. And I think one of the problems though is that we're not as sophisticated as we can be in terms of the functional hearing tests that I think would be better behavioral biomarkers of what, um, especially when you get to central auditory processing deficits are going to be more informative. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely a large percent of people where, you know, an inner ear problem can be well diagnosed and that they, they could be well treated with a hearing aid. Um, but the place where I think we really need to move forward within the field is coming up with more of the behavioral biomarkers that map onto the specific hearing complaints that people have. Thank you. What is the latest information regarding cilia regeneration? And regeneration is in quotes. That definitely is outside of my expertise um, in that, so, you know, there we're looking at, um, once again, a kind of inner ear problem where I think there, there is exciting research that, um, you know, I see at conferences that's promising. What I don't have a good sense of is what is the time course of translation for those? Um, and so yeah, if you want to send me an email, I'd be happy to refer you to people who would know more about that. And there's an extremely long and sophisticated entry that follows from the, the same person. And so um, Dr. Seitz will respond to that individually also. 
If there is hearing loss, what do you recommend in terms of the game theory? Is it a game theory? Yeah, I'm not sure if there is hearing. Maybe, um, uh, Mr. Underwood, if you could send a, another note to clarify that question, we, we can share that with Dr. Seitz. Um, what would this brain training work with people with severe or profound hearing loss? So the training really is focused on people who have what I'd call central hearing um, processing deficits. And so if the, so a lot of these questions so far, you know, are focused on kind of more traditional audiology where we're looking at the, you know, inner ear um, isn't functioning well. Um, how do we amplify the sounds so they could hear something? And so if you have prof profound hearing loss and it's related to um, really the ear's function, this is not where my training is likely to be beneficial because um, that's the problem where the probably the best thing is going to be a hearing aid, which is going to amplify the sounds. Once you get that hearing aid, then there's a question of how well can you make the sounds intelligible? How can you understand them? And that's the place where now the brain is more involved and where my program can potentially augment the benefits of that hearing aid because what we're really focused on is once you're able to hear the sounds, how can you make sense of them? And that often what happens is that when you basically turn up the volume, um, what the hearing aid is doing, you turn up the volume of everything. And so in some cases, and it does depend upon the particular brand of hearing aid you have and its particular features, that, um, by increasing the noise as well as the signal, that you do create some additional problems for the brain to solve. And so training programs like what I create, um, you know, might be able to help with that aspect of things. Next question, is there use of your brain game center to improve mild hearing loss? So that's, probably one of the places where we could serve people best because, and this is similar to the talk that I gave on vision, is that when you think about something like mild hearing loss, that there's two ways to solve this. One way is to treat the source of the hearing loss, which you know might very well be um, you know, the ear or the inner ear, and that um, so that would be an issue of amplification. The other way is to train your brain to be able to better deal with the sounds. And that part of the um, hearing loss could already be because of brain processes. But even if the brain is working normally, if you're able to train it to work a little bit better, then that's a way to potentially compensate. And so when you look at the college students that we trained, you know, these are the people, they, they don't have hearing loss. You know, they actually have exquisite hearing, but we show that there's still some room for improvement. And so that's definitely an area where we think there's potential of our approach to health. Can you tell us if we signed up for one of your studies, what type of activities we might participate in that would train or test my hearing? Sure. So, um, the way that typically works is that we build apps that will mostly run on um, you know, phones and tablets. Um, some of our apps will do things on computers as well. And that the tests typically are ones where you're given some instructions and then your played sounds and the most common test is one where you just report by clicking a box, which sound is different from the others. And that 
what we do is that every time you get it right, we think, okay, you probably heard it. Let's make it a little bit more difficult. When you get it wrong, we think, okay, maybe you didn't hear it. We'll make it a little bit easier. And we basically kind of go back and forth trying to find what is the level that you could just barely hear it at. And then we do this for different types of sounds. And then some of our tests are ones where, like I showed you um, with that grid with colors and numbers where you hear you know, words that are saying colors and numbers and you have to basically report what you heard. Um, the training programs typically will have you do some of these tests and then it will be a game like I showed you where um, it will provide similar challenges. So it's pretty much the same as the test when we're training people in that we provide these sounds that you have to respond to by going up or down or left or right and that we try to find the point where you could barely hear it. And once you find that point, we give you lots of practice. And a lot of our training, what we're trying to do is basically move that so that you could hear more and more subtle things. Terrific, thank you. And then this is our final question. Um, among those of us in the general audience, what is most commonly misunderstood about our capacity to improve or change our hearing? I really think that it's how the brain hears. Because when you look at, and, it, and hearing is kind of the same thing as vision, is that from the medical approach, we think, well, there's an organ. That organ is, you know, the inner ear where, you know, this is something that um, either functions properly or doesn't function properly. And we basically try to fix how that essentially transduces sounds. So it turns, you know, sounds from, you know, a, um, you know, wave in the air to something that the brain is able to perceive. Once it gets the brain, then traditional medicine doesn't know what to do with it. And that this is the place where for the last 30, 40 years, neuroscience has been making lots of advances of like, how does the brain hear? But very little of this has gotten into um, how we test hearing. So like the audiogram, you know, was, you know, developed over 80 years ago and hasn't changed much. And so the place where things both are the least well understood, but there's the greatest opportunity for improvement is trying to better understand the dimensions that are important for how the brain hears how to measure those to be able to understand people who have different central hearing processing issues. And then what are the things that we can intervene and that for the brain, oftentimes training is going to be the easier solution than surgery. Great. Um, Professor Seitz, thank you so much for another tremendous lecture and for all the um, fascinating answers. And thank you to our guests for those terrific questions. We've reached the end of our time this evening. Many thanks to all of you for joining us. Please be sure to join us for our next Brain Game Center lecture by Professor Seitz. That will be on memory on Wednesday, April 28th at 6 p.m. And you may register at palmdesert.ucr.edu. Once again, thank you all. Good night and please stay safe and well.